Isn't it amazing that uh, the God who created all this world that we enjoy, uh, Jesus was God from the very beginning. And he gave up that glory for a little while and he came down here and God became a human being in Jesus Christ. And he lived a perfect life that none of us here can live. <laughs> We're sinners. And he died that agonizing death to, to show his love. He didn't have to do it. But the only way that we could be, have a way to, to make ourselves right with God was through Jesus. The love of God. Beautiful song. Well, good morning again. Open your Bible to Acts chapter uh, 21. We're going through the book of Acts, and we're moving right along. And open your Bible to Acts chapter 21, and we'll be looking at verses 18 through 36. And something is going on. It's probably uh, my microphone. How are we doing, Brother David? I'm good now. Okay. I'll do my best. But let's all stand in honor of God's word. And uh, I don't know what I'm doing. It's, maybe it's where I put it. Maybe I need to move it in a different place here. Okay. Maybe that's better. Okay. Let's, this is in honor of God's word. We're reading uh, Acts chapter 21, debtors to the gospel, and beginning we'll break in at verse 18 where we ended off last Sunday. This is the word of God. Now, on the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And when he had greeted them, he told them in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews that are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law, but... They have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought to circumcise, not circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come to Jerusalem. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who, are taking, who have taken a vow. Take them... And be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they are informed concerning you are nothing but that you yourself also walk orderly in keeping the law. But concerning the Gentiles, we believe we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood and from things strangled and from sexual uh, immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. And now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him, that is Paul, in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, we also brought Greeks into the temple, and he brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed. And the people ran together, seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. And now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. And he immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. And then the commander came near and took him, commanding him to be bound with two chains and he asked who he was and what he had done. And some, some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people 
followed after, crying out, Away with him, or kill him. May the Lord add a blessing to the public reading of his word. And as we do often, I want to take your hand and put it over your heart. We're not going to do the Pledge of Allegiance, but, but we're going to feel our, I hope you feel your heart beating there today. And as you feel your heart beating, what's on your heart today? Just release that. What are you, what are you thinking about that's preventing you from, from worshiping as you should today? If it's a burden, it's somebody you're concerned about, just just release that to the Lord and let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you today that you do love us. And you showed that love by sending your only, your one and only Son to this earth to die in our place, to pay the price for our sins so that we could be right with you through trusting in Him. Thank you for your love, for your grace, your mercy, for the good news, the gospel. God, as we proclaim that gospel today, if there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus as their personal Savior, may this be the day. If there's others who are carrying burdens that they don't need to carry, that they can just give them to you, Lord. May each one give those burdens to you. Speak to us, Lord. Speak to us clearly and help us to respond as you would have us do today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Paul, the, the famous... Apostle, theologian, God used him to write at least 13 books of the Bible. Great missionary, a church planner, started churches everywhere, great leader. You know, we've learned he's not a, he's not a fellow you want to hang out with, folks. <laughs> I love hanging out with my grandkids. I love hanging out with some of our fellow missionaries this weekend that came through here. Uh, they went down to Florida. They live in Oklahoma City and, and uh, went down to visit uh, one, the, the mother of the lady, Ruth, and uh, found out she's terminally ill. And they came back up from Tampa, and on their way back to Oklahoma City, they stayed at our house. And so we reminisced about our years in the Philippines as missionaries and had a great time. You know, I, I love hanging out with folks, but, but Paul was somebody, folks, you wouldn't want to hang out with. <laughs> but most of us wouldn't. Uh, it was danger, dangerous to hang out with this guy. He, he was always getting beat up. He was always getting run out of town. He tell us, tells us in his letter to the Corinthians how many times he was beaten almost to his death and shipwrecked and all those kinds of things. And, you know, um, and I think everybody here who is a follower of Jesus Christ uh, and lives for the gospel, to share the gospel with others, um, would, would want to be around Paul. But, but you know... My pride, <laughs> and maybe your pride, tells me that, 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 you know, I thought I was, I was entitled to a comfortable life. That, that, that God should take care of me for all that I've done for Him and all of I've done for the gospel. You know, if we're not careful, that's, that's the kind of thinking we get into in this world. <coughs> You see, but, but we're going to learn this morning, you, we can't be a, a real follower of Christ, an obedient one, and we can't be a church on mission with God if we feel that God owes us. Do you feel God owes you? I mean, we are living in the age, this, if you want one word to, in, in, uh, to, to, to put over our culture in America today, it's the word entitlement. Entitlement. We, we, we live in a time where, where, where people uh, feel entitled. Uh, what, what I mean by entitlement basically translates to this. I did this, so I deserve this. <laughs> but don't we know, those of us who are followers of... If we, if we believe in the gospel, if we really believe in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, then we can only say, God did this. <laughs> God did this in Jesus Christ. God did this. And if God did this, then he owes me nothing and I owe him everything. <laughs> I am a debtor. They tell us that the average American owes about 50, a little over $15,000 in credit card debt. And for most people, that's a, lot, that's a lot of debt. But I want to tell you today, folks, we owe a whole lot more than that to God. <laughs> We owe our very life. We owe our salvation. We owe our eternity. 
If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christ follower this morning, you owe it all. God doesn't owe us anything. And uh, we owe him everything. I am debtor to the gospel. That's what Paul said. You know, in, in chapter 20, if you look back there in verse 24, we see Paul's life verse. For he says this, but none of these things move me. He was being <laughs> messed with then. But he said, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish the race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. And he was living out his life verse. And we see it here again. We learn in, verse, in chapter 20 that, that uh, the qualities of a well-spent life were to persevere in the times of trouble and adversity. Where we walk in the footsteps of Jesus... And we see Paul doing that right here. Last week we learned about the, the will of God, God's will, how to, uh, what it is and how to, how to live it. And we found out it's quite complex sometimes and it's very costly to do the will of God in our day today in 2018. But you know, Paul believed more and more that he was a debtor to the gospel. And it allowed him as he said, to finish his rate, to finish his course and the ministry that had been given him to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. What do I mean this morning by saying that we are debtors? That we are debtors to the gospel? Well, let me just start by saying what I, what I don't mean. It does, to be a debtor to the gospel does not mean that we in any way are trying to earn or work our way to heaven or for our salvation because we know we sang it already. Jesus saves. The only one who can save, that, that's it. There's no question about it. Jesus is the only one that can save us. We cannot, you cannot do enough work to outweigh your bad. Uh, the only way that you can be saved is through Jesus Christ. That's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So that's not what I'm saying when I say we're debtors to God. It also does not mean that we in any way are trying to um, pay back or, or repay God because he paid a debt, as we sang, that, we di that he didn't owe for a debt that I could not pay. Because <laughs> if I paid for my sins, I would spend, my, spend eternity in hell. But Jesus didn't have any sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so I'm not talking about repay. You can't repay God. <laughs> you, you can't pay that debt. There's no way. But it does mean that the Bible says we are slaves of God. In Romans chapter 6, verse 18, it says that. We were slaves to sin, but now through Jesus Christ, we are slaves. <coughs> we're slaves to the gospel. We are slaves to righteousness. We are slaves of God. And uh, we're to become more like Jesus Christ. We're obligated to share the gospel, the good news with other people. We are debtors. Paul said this in Romans. He said, I'm a debtor to the Greeks, to the barbarians, to the wise, the unwise, to share the gospel with them. We are debtors this morning. What is a debtor? Somebody who doesn't live after the flesh, according to Romans 8, 12, and 13. Someone who lives by the Spirit. Someone who is, whose life is motivated and energized and moved by the Spirit of God. If you're a Christian today, if you're a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God, God Himself lives in your heart. We don't, we don't need a temple. <laughs> you know, in the Old Testament, they had the temple. They had the tabernacle where the presence of... We don't need any of that today. Once you put your faith and trust in Jesus, God... This is, this is the miracle of, of, and different from any other uh, faith in the world. God himself, by his spirit, comes to live in you, in your life. The God of the universe, by his spirit. And so, that's what a person who is dead... If, if, if I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, if our church, if Temple Baptist Church wants to become a church on mission with God, joining God in his mission, we need to be reminded this morning of the cost of our salvation for our perspective in order for it to change from entitlement to indebtedness. Folks, we are not entitled to anything. All we get is because of the grace of God. 
Undeserved. That's what grace is. Undeserved favor. Every breath you breathe and that heart that you felt beating right there, every beat of that heart comes from the grace of God. That's why you're alive today. And so, so we need to be reminded of how does, but how does the gospel do this? Well, it does it in two ways. First of all, how does this come? How, how do we become, how do we grasp what it means to be indebted to God and not to be entitled? It's from the humility that comes from the gospel. You see, the gospel, uh, I started to say humiliates, and, and, and that's, that's kind of true. Humility. Paul, Paul's friends here in Caesarea, remember, last, they, they begged him. They said, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't, don't go to Jerusalem. But notice, we also read that after they tried to dissuade him, it says in verse 14, we saw last Sunday of chapter 21, he said, but let the will of the Lord be done. <laughs> let the will of the Lord be done. Lord willing. And uh, so they gave up and they left for Jerusalem. And the Bible says here in verse 18 that when they got to Jerusalem, Paul and his companions went to visit the elders. They went to visit James, who was the chief elder of the church there in Jerusalem, and the other elders. And he, Paul begins to tell them one by one all of the specific things that God had done among the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and the, how many had come to the Lord, how many churches had been started. And it says, the Bible says here, they rejoiced for the success of the ministry that God had given Paul there, and they, but they expressed some concerns <laughs> about some rumors. Yeah, there were some rumors. Oh, me, rumors. Oh, me, gossip. Oh, me, rumors. So there was all these rumors that he was teaching Jews to abandon their customs, especially uh, circumcision, which was the badge of the God's covenant for the Jewish people. And so they said, Paul, uh, here's what we want you to do. We, you need to purify yourself along with these four guys who have taken up a Nazarite vow. If you want to know what a Nazarite vow is, go back to Numbers chapter 6. It tells about all that. And, uh, and you need to go with them and you need to pay for their expenses and you need to show um, that when the time comes for this vow, uh, for them to cut their hair and to, and to make their offering there in the temple, then people will know that, that, that all those rumors are not true. <laughs> if Paul went with them and he paid the cost of their offering, it would show that, that he did not object to Jewish people following, uh, followers of Christ following their customs. And you know, Paul could have said, we've already settled this. You remember the, the council <laughs> back there in chapter 11? He could, he could have started arguing with them. But you know what Paul did? He humbled himself. He humbled himself. And he, and he responds with humility. He voluntarily did what they suggested and he, he purifies himself and he covers the expenses of these men. He willingly joined these four men. He did what he said that he was about in 1 Corinthians 9.22. Become all things to all men in order that I might win some. That's what he did. He didn't have to do this, but he did it. He did it for the sake of the gospel, for advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, folks, if we're not careful, and you and I have probably done it and we've witnessed it, some of our brothers, you know, zeal, um, zeal is a wonderful thing. You know, uh, to be very eager, to have enthusiasm and determination uh, in itself, that's, that's not bad. But when zeal for the Lord and the gospel is misguided and takes precedence, precedent over the gospel, it actually gets in the way of the work of God. You have seen that happen. Actually, it happened to Jesus. Remember when Jesus in Matthew 16 was telling, trying to explain to the disciples, you know, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. Peter, who was always sticking his foot in his mouth, what did Peter say? He said, no, Lord, no, 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 no way, no way. He was very passionate. And he came to Jesus and said, no, Lord, no, no, that cannot be. You cannot go and die. What did Jesus say? <laughs> Get behind me, Satan. You don't savor the things of God, but the things of men. You see, your zeal, folks, is great, but it can get you in trouble. It can get you in trouble as a follower of Jesus. Peter was, was very je zealous. 
But praise God, we know from the Bible that he was humbled by Jesus and he ultimately became a slave of Jesus and he followed Jesus. And for years and years, I believe the church of Jesus Christ has been divided itself, been slowed down, even lost its mission because some of uh, believers have, have decided to be zealous rather than to be like Christ. A word for us, zeal is not always bad, but humility is always better. Zeal is not always bad, but humility is always better. What does Paul say later on? You humble yourself, you'll be exalted. God resists the proud. Folks, even good old-fashioned Christian pride. (laughs) And we all admit we have that sometimes. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And so... We see this in Paul's life here. Are there things about your Christian faith that you're passionate about? I hope so. (laughs) I hope you're passionate about some things. What What are some aspects of your own personal convictions that can potentially become stumbling blocks to the gospel? Can we recognize when something is simply a preference You know, Christians get all strung up about stuff. A lot of stuff doesn't matter. It's preference stuff. And when we get hung up on that stuff, we become a stumbling block to the gospel. We need to think about this this morning. I need to think about this this morning as your pastor. Let's be characterized by humility because we've had a deep experience of the gospel, of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon, one of my great guys that I read, talking about the amazing power of God's grace, this is what he said, "There, there is a cementing power in the grace of God which can scarcely be overestimated. He says this, it resets the dislocated bones of our society. It rivets the bonds of friendship. It wells together the broken metal of manhood into one united mass. That's the grace of God. It it unites all brethren who feel its power. Grace links mankind in a common brotherhood. Grace makes the, the great man give his hand to the poor man. Confess a heavenly relationship. Grace constrains the intellectual and the learned and the polite to stoop from their dignity to take hold of the ignorant and the unfettered and unlettered, calling them friends. Grace weaves the threads of our separate individualities into an undivided unity. He said, let the gospel, let the gospel be felt in the mind and in the heart and it will toll the nail of selfishness and it will bring down the proud from their elevated solitude and it will restore the downtrodden to the rights of common manhood. That's the grace of God, the amazing grace of God. Temple Baptist Church today... As we grow in faith and dig deeper into the Word of God, I pray that we would also grow more in humility and in grace, even in our disagreements, even when we don't agree about things. And when things change and we don't like it, we must remember that we are all indebted to the gospel, we are not entitled. I don't hear very many amens today. (laughs) Somebody say, I'm a debtor. We are all debtors. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are indebted to the gospel. You are indebted to God. But what else? How how else does the gospel remind us that we're, we're debtors? Well, the second thing and the final thing this morning is from, it's from the peace that comes from the gospel. We not only get humility from the gospel, we get the peace of God, the peace of God that passes all understanding. Paul, Paul knew that his life was leading up to an impending doom. He said that in, in verse 13 of this chapter. You look at it there in, in 21, 13, Paul answered, 
What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound. Of course, in this, he got bound by two chains here. But I'm not only willing to be bound, but I also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul knew, of course, he was beheaded in Rome later, but he knew it was coming. He knew it was coming. But even after, notice, even after he, hum, he humbled himself and he went along with the suggestion of the church elders, he, did, he didn't have to do what he did, but he did. What they, he embraced these, these Jewish uh, customs and heritage that he was from. Um, notice what happened. He's still wrongly accused. <laughs> even though he humbled himself, he was still wrongly accused. He was dragged out of the temple. They were going to kill him. God used what Jews would call the dirty dogs, <laughs> Roman soldiers, to show grace to him. They came, they, they heard what was going on. They're about to tear Paul apart. And the, the commander of the Roman that garrison there heard what was going on. And he sent some soldiers down in there. And they went in there and they <laughs> literally pulled Paul out of there before they tore him apart. And in the midst of that chaos, the Bible doesn't tell us here, but we get it from his other writings. I believe Paul was at peace with God. He was ready to be with the Lord. If this was his time, he was ready. I don't think he was fighting them. He was at peace with God. He would eventually state his case before the Jews. He would share his testimony. He's going to share it three times, actually, we're going to see. He's going to even preach the gospel to them. But how could he do it? Because he was sold out to the Lord he had already written, as I said last Sunday, he had already written that blank check to God. Already written that blank check to God. This allowed him to press on toward the goal, to live for Christ, to testify the gospel of the grace of God, to keep on going because he knew that he was fighting the good fight. He was finishing the course. He was keeping the faith. How does this happen? How does someone endure so much mistreatment and just keep on keeping on, keep on giving? There's only one answer, folks. We already sang about it. Amazing grace. The amazing grace of God. That's the only way that Paul could have done what he did. It comes, it comes from accepting, folks, that you're forgiven, as I said last Sunday. Some of you said it last Sunday, but I'll ask you to say it again. Say, I'm forgiven. If you're a follower of Jesus, forgiven. you're forgiven, folks. Every sin you've ever committed, every one you will commit. That's the grace of God. Yes, Paul accepted that he was forgiven. It comes from understanding the depth of your sin and the price that was paid to purchase our salvation. Temple Baptist Church this morning, when, when you have peace with God, you can have peace with other people. You can even have peace with people that you don't like. You can even have peace with your enemies. That's what the Bible says. If you have the grace of if you have experienced the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Beloved, this peace is what allowed Paul to give his life for the gospel not expecting anything in return till, till he breathed his last breath. So let me, as I close this message this morning, how, how does Jesus' work on the cross for you allow you to take up your cross daily and follow him? Consider Jesus this morning. If you've never really considered Jesus, consider Jesus this morning. His love, his humility... His grace, how he was abandoned by his friends, even by his father when he cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus was abandoned so that you and I could never be abandoned. <laughs> Think about that. Never alone. You're never alone. If you're a follower of Jesus. He's always with you. When we embrace this truth, when we embrace this gospel, <laughs> we can gladly be debtors to the gospel and we can gladly continue on, continue on, just like Paul. A debtor, folks, is not, not everybody you meet. <laughs> 
you will know the debtors. You'll know the debtors in your life. You'll know the debtors in this church or any church you go to. They're the ones that don't complain. They don't gripe and grumble. They just want to be usable until the Lord come back, comes back or until they get called home. <laughs> you see, you're always, at all times, paying a debt. We are debtors to the gospel. We need to be either speaking it or living it, living it out so the grace of God can affect the lives of other people around us. They can hear, they can understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're the only Jesus, folks, that most people will ever see. Did you realize that? If you're a follower of Jesus, you're his hands, you're his feet, you're his eyes. You're the only Jesus that most people will ever meet. Don't forget that if you're a follower of Jesus. He lives in you. And we're to show Jesus to other people. We're to love folks. We live in a broken world, folks. All of us here are broken. <laughs> we're, in a, we're, we're, a mess. we're a mess. Every one of us, including myself. <laughs> Without the grace of God, without the mercy of God, where would we be, brothers and sisters? The gospel humbles us and it gives us peace so that we can keep on keeping on. Yes, that's the message today. And you know, when you adopt this perspective that you're a debtor of God, you know what, what, what it actually does? It frees you. You want to be free today? <laughs> we, we value freedom, don't we, here in America? You want to really be free today? Adopt this perspective. I am a debtor to the gospel of God in Jesus Christ. Let's stand. Would you bow with me? And let's pray. And we're going to have, we're going to sing this great hymn. It's not one that we normally would sing for an invitation, but it's, I hope as we sing it, we will, we will really get the deep meaning of these, these words that we sing in Christ alone. But let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, show us once again that you're God. Show us who you are, what you have done for us in Christ. May each one of us surrender our pride, surrender our, our sense of entitlement so that we may embrace Jesus and all that he is, our Lord and our Savior, who has invited us to come to him and rest because his yoke is easy, his burden is light. Remind us this morning that we are debtors to the gospel, we're slaves of righteousness, so that we can humbly persevere and continue on in the gospel and we can overcome by your peace the peace that passes all understanding, Lord, whatever we're facing. God, folks here today, I know that some are facing some very difficult decisions, some difficult things in life. God, make your grace known as we sing this time of invitation. I pray in Jesus' name.